Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Calvary United Methodist Church and just uh, uh, want, to, want to say it was a great time for two weeks to have some time off. Uh, Kathy and I had a, a wonderful time as we headed out to the Grand Canyon, um, but, but really am welcome and, and grateful to be back worshiping with you on Sunday morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements that we have this morning, actually four of them. I want to point out um, a, a Approximately a month from now, we're going to be holding an event. It's called Graceful Aging. Uh, so mark your calendars for our August 21st. Um, we're going to be from 9 o'clock in the morning to roughly noon in the af- uh, noon, uh, right around noon. We're going to be um, bringing in uh, various individuals, three specifically, to kind of deal with um, uh, end-of-life type scenarios and to help us to to pre-plan in a graceful way, so so that we are ready for our um, uh, end-of-life uh, scenarios, whatever they might be. So mark your calendars for that. The second thing is, um, and I uh, meant to uh, uh, talk to, to Bev about this, but um, it sounds like uh, Adult Sunday School has restarted right here at Calvary United Methodist Church, and, and, and at 1045, the Peacemakers class is going to be meeting, so, so just want you to mark your calendars for that as well. Um, the second, or the third thing I want to point out is uh, Don Man uh, passed uh, this past year, and and we're gonna um, we've been postponing many of our services, but we're gonna hold a celebration of life right here at Calvary United Methodist Church on the 31st, which is two weeks from yesterday. So if you're able to go ahead and please uh, mark your calendars and join us for that celebration of life. And the final thing is um, uh, Christmas in July. Yes, next week is July the 25th. And that is the day that we're going to be celebrating Christmas in July. Um, so, so join us as we sing carols. Join us as, uh, after the service as we fellowship um, and just kind of enjoy the, uh, the warmth of cookies and the, uh, the fellowship after the service. But, but everything that we do next week is going to be focused on Christmas and, and bringing in gifts, and specifically gifts that are going to be given to uh, SPA or SPA, depending on how you uh, um, uh, read that. But, but there's a, a pamphlet, it's a green pamphlet in the back that says, you know, these are the things that they need. And so we're going to be giving back to spa next Christmas and uh, next July, I'm sorry, next week at July the 25th. So join us for that. So let's go ahead and stand as we worship together.
Chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am. 
eternal God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We ask that you just allow us to, to be still. Still our soul as we gather and worship. Still our soul as we gather in fellowship. Still our soul as we gather in community. Father, we lay each and every one of our concerns down at your feet. Maybe we think of it as lifting it up to you. But whatever those things are, Father, we give them to you. We hand them over to you, knowing that you are the great healer. We name the name of the individual who's upon our heart, and maybe that, that individual is ourselves. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child, a loved one, a friend, a companion. We lift their name up to you this morning, Father, recognizing that you understand every aspect of their struggle. We ask that you put your hand of comfort on them, your word of peace, your guiding light. We pray this morning for those who are gathered here this morning. We pray for the community that surrounds the church that we are gathering in. We pray for the broader sense of Indiana may, and, and even beyond to the, into the United States and to the world itself. We lift each and every individual up to you saying, Father, guide them, allow them to feel your presence and allow them to know that you are with them. We specifically pray for the leaders within the churches in the government, in the schools, the nurses, the doctors, the paramedics, the firefighters, all of those individuals that we come in contact with and maybe those that we don't even know. We lift their names up to you this morning, Father. And Father, this morning we thank you that you've given us this opportunity to gather in fellowship just as Jesus Christ did so many years ago with his disciples, as he gathered with them and taught them to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. <coughs> but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning as we uh, gather and worship together, we're going to change up the service just a little bit. Normally we read the, the scripture passage uh, at this point, but we're going to read it just a little bit later in the service. But um, this morning uh, we're going to embark upon a series. Um, I look at it as a three-week series, although we're going to have a week break for Christmas in July next week. But, but this uh, series originated in a continuing ed course that, that I took back in late May, early June. It was led by the the Reverend Dr. Ken Ramsey. He serves the United Methodist Church down in um, West Virginia. Um, and and the, the series that he named it was Rebuilding and Positioning the Church. And it all was a, 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 an endeavor that he embarked upon as, as um, prior to the pandemic, but then when the pandemic hit, he noticed a need within his own church to to, to, to really struggle and grapple with this concept of rebuilding and positioning the church. Now, he began, and we are too, going to begin by discerning 12 characteristics that, that paint of a picture of the, of the current cultural reality. 
a picture that is clearly evident within the church that we, we are engaged in this morning, this local church, but in, in, and also in every single church that, that, that litters throughout the entire world. Now, as we sift through these, uh, these characteristics, these 12 characteristics, I want you to ask yourself this one question. Which are most relevant to me? Which are most relevant to the church that we are in? Which are most relevant to the culture or the society that we engage in every day? Now, I want you to notice that the first seven of these 12 characteristics, uh, um, they were all present prior to the pandemic. They were all there. So, so just recognize the first seven are that way. The first one is uh, known as uh, sensory overload. Now, this became very real to me as we boarded and traveled on the train from Chicago to Flagstaff. For over 40 hours, we experienced this constant barrage of people walking up and down the aisles, going to the observatory car or to the concession stand or, or maybe just going to visit somebody. Maybe they were headed to the bathroom, but people were constantly going up and down the train. It just became very real to me as they pulled out their phones and started to play games or text people or do whatever it is that people do on their phones or the announcements that came over in the cars of the train. For me, it was absolutely impossible to try to sleep. I found myself half an hour of snippets, maybe an hour if at best I could get myself comfortable. Or, or if I tried to work, just wasn't working. There was too much constant barrage going on. It was practically impossible for me to do any of that stuff. Now, the same occurs in our everyday lives. There is this ever-present amount of activity going on. There are signs everywhere as you're driving down the road. There are people that you're connecting with every single day. There are cars that are constantly I don't know about you, but irritating you on the road, checking our smartwatches, having to go back and look at Facebook, wanting to know what the next movie on Netflix is going to be. We even have it right here in the sanctuary, right? Cameras, projectors, screens, the sound system. Now, these are all good gifts, don't get me wrong. They're all good gifts, but even good gifts can be misused or overused. So the first characteristic, sensory overload. Here's the second one. By the way, it affects each and every one of us. Here's the second one. People, people will overbook their lives. Had a conversation this morning about that. You want my personal example? You probably heard it in the past. Monday through Friday, I'm up by at least 5 a.m. I'm at work somewhere around 6 a.m. I work until 4 o'clock in the afternoon over at the post office. Monday through Friday, every single evening, I have something going on whether it's church work, Bible study fellowship, errands, tasks. Saturdays, I spend getting ready for the Sunday morning service, and then Sunday, well, it's Sunday, right? Now, I'm giving you a personal example, but most of society is in that very same boat. Granted, your boats all look a little bit different. Every one of us have a different boat that we're sailing in. And sadly, people decide if they will participate in church participate in a relationship with Jesus Christ based on how booked their lives are, right? So the second characteristic, overbooking our lives, and that affects us as well. Here's the third, the third characteristic. The pace of life is absolutely unsustainable. There was a time in every one of our lives when all that occurred in church I'm sorry, on Sundays was church. Not so today. In fact, today, 
families rarely have time to sit around the dinner table and have dinner with each other as a family. Many people are simply far too busy to be able to sit down and have conversations around a dinner table with their own family. Just kind of curious. You don't need to raise hands or anything, but just think about this. How difficult was it to stop the on the, the how difficult was it for you to stop the pace of life at the onset of the pandemic when they said need you to stop everything how difficult was that ever pondered that have you ever pondered the consequences of the pace of life let me give you two things that i came up with we start to have shorter and shorter and shorter attention spans sitting in a service, listening to a message. What happens? We can't do it. Here's another one. Our patience starts to dwindle. I find myself having a conversation with somebody already moving on to the next conversation before this one's even done. You ever done that? That's the next, that's the third one. The pace, the fast pace of life, well, it's simply unsustainable and it affects each and every one of us. Here's the fourth one, ideological addictions. Yes, each and every one of us in this room see life by looking through a certain ideological lens. Every one of us does, it doesn't matter. Truthfully, we become so tied to our ideologies that if anything in war of the world challenges our ideology, it will not compute with us. We just stand there and block it out. It just simply does not compute with us. In fact, we become so addicted to our particular ideology that we can't see beyond that ideology, which keeps us from seeing other important ideas. I want you to just kind of think about this, politics. Each and every one of the people in here has an issue with a ideology in politics, environmentalism, sports, health care, education, and yes, even religion. Ideological addictions is the fourth one, and that affects each and every one of us. Here's the fifth one, emotional deficits. We've been in this cycle for over a year now, but these emotional deficits were present before that. And they've all been amplified by this highly polarized society that we've been living in for quite some time now. Emotions like anger, resentment, withdrawal, depression, fear. Rather than, than being able to take a step back and dealing with our own emotions, what do we do? We approach people by trying to talk louder than they can so that we can get our point across. We become angrier to cancel out their opinions. We lash out more often. A small nick on a very tight rope will cause harm. And that's what happens when our emotional deficits start to take order. Emotional deficits result in the inability to resolve our own emotions in a productive and a fruitful way. And so there is your fifth example, emotional deficits. They affect us and they cause harm. Here's the sixth one. Spirituality becomes a hobby rather than a lifestyle. Think about that. I want to give you an example. In the year 2000, church attendance was somewhere around 70%. Now, when I say church attendance, I'm going to use this in a broader sense. It doesn't have to be the Protestant church. It could be the Catholic church. It can be um, uh, the Muslim faith. Any religious organization, church attendance was at a, about 70%. Five years later, by the way, what happened in between 2000 and 2005? 
9-11, right? You would think the church attendance would have gone up. But five years later, it went down to 64%. By 2010, church attendance had gone down to 61%. By 2015, it was down to 55%. And yes, I realize that the pandemic happened last year, but by 2020, church attendance was down to 47%. Think about that. Something else to ponder in this whole thing is this, that the definition of active church attendance used to be three out of four Sundays. Today, people define church, active church attendance as one or two times a month. If I go to church one time a month, that is active church attendance. That affects those percentages. Just ponder that for a moment. Church, the body of Christ seems to have lost sight that church was intended to be a lifestyle, not a hobby. So that's the next one, six, is a spirituality becomes a hobby rather than a lifestyle, and that affects us. It causes us harm. Here's the seventh one, political religiosity. People religiously hold to their political views. In fact, we look to reinforce our views through our religion, and we hold them with an urgency so much so that they become, well, a religion in itself. Now, I'm not going to say any more about that because that becomes very polarizing in itself, but, but recognize that that seventh one, political religiosity, it affects each and every one of us. It affects the body of Christ, and it causes harm to the body of Christ. So those are your first seven. Here are the last five, and the last five were heightened during this whole pandemic uh, uh, as we've gone through this last year. I want you to recognize that as we look at these seven. Eight, so uh, I'm sorry, the last five. Eight is experience of loss. And that has been heightened during this last year. People have lost their incomes. People have lost their desire to be productive citizens. People have lost habits. Just out of curiosity, how easy is it to go out to eat right now? You can't get into a restaurant unless you have to wait for an hour and a half. Those were some of our habits. Going to a football game, going to a basketball game, going to a baseball game. Thanksgiving. Christmas, Easter. We've lost all of these things, and I haven't even mentioned lost, that we've lost. 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 There are a wide variety of ways in which people process loss. Just massive amounts of different ways. And sometimes they don't even process loss. So number eight was a heightened and that's the experience loss, and that, that affects each and every one of us in all kinds of different ways. Here's number nine. Negative emotions, which I've already mentioned, have been heightened. Emotions like anger, heightened. Fear, heightened. Blame, heightened. Guilt, sadness. People projected on themselves, and they projected on others. All of it has been heightened, and these negative emotions, they have residual effects. Each and every one of them have a residual effect. For instance, we develop a pessimistic view of, of the future, and this pessimistic view um, affects us personally. It affects the, the community of Christ. It affects society. It affects each and every one of us. And so there's the ninth one. Negative, emotion, negative emotions have been heightened and they affect each and every one of us and they cause harm. Here's number 10. We all have mixed responses to change. It seems like every arena of our lives has been changed, right? We, we've gone to appointments 
Those have changed. We go grocery shopping. Go this way down this aisle, this way down that aisle. Stay six feet apart. Wear a mask. Coming to church. It was really rough. And we all respond differently because we are all, every one of us are wired differently. And so that's your 10th one. Mixed responses to change has been heightened and it affects us and it causes harm. Here's number 11. Each and every one of us have this elevated sense of anxiety. We were already living in an anxiety ridden society. But our anxiety ridden culture, our, our anxiety ridden, um, risen, ridden uh, society, whatever, however you want to look at it, was heightened during this pandemic. Uh, think about it this way. What does the future hold? Many of us were asking that question uh, throughout this entire thing. What does our future hold as the church had to stop meeting? What does my future hold? You've seen this resurgence or this um, insurgence of, of doomsday prepping. Get your meals now. Put them aside because. What about the sense of the overreach of government into various aspects of your life as they monitor Facebook, as they monitor Twitter, as they're now starting to talk about monitoring texting messages? What about the world politics and how all of that plays in it? How will my children be educated in this society? How will my job change? Will I even have a job? How will the social structure change? And that elevates our sense of anxiety. And that affects each and every one of us, and it has been heightened, and it causes harm. Now, all of these 11, these first 11, lead to number 12. Number 12 is we all have instability in our lives. We've all lost our, let me call it, societal balance. We find ourselves trying to walk forward as we're relearning how to walk. And we have pain as we try to learn how to walk. Pain from emotional instability, pain from psychological stress, pain from physical struggles that may be let because of the other two. And we all have spiritual withdrawal. How many of us said when the church started to regather, said, wait a second, I kind of like sitting at home rather than coming in? Spiritual withdrawal. That's number 12. Instability in our lives has been heightened and it affects each and every one of us and it causes us harm. Now, you may be asking, Paul, why are you pointing all of this out? Why is this so vital that we discern the times in which we live? Well, in order for us to deepen our faith, in order for us to, well, let's say, rebuild the church, in order for us to position the church for the future, we must first grapple with, we must first discern so that we can understand the times in which we live in, what we're facing. And please hear me, each of these characteristics affects how the Spirit is able to move in each and every one of us. So, I started off by asking the question, which of these 12 characteristics, which of them resonates most with you, resonates most within the church, and why? Knowing that will be important in discovering new avenues for our spiritual development. Knowing this will also be important in developing connecting points within the society that surrounds us. The one that we live in, the one that we work in, the one that we engage in. So we must discern and we must know each and every one of these characteristics. Because our culture is experiencing the same thing. We're, we need to do that if we're going to be prepared to rebuild and position 
this church to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Only when the church has its eyes wide open to the situations, to the experiences that are around us, will the church be best prepared to actually offer Christ's message and show how that message can provide salvation in their lives. So which of these 12 characteristics resonates most with you, most with the church that we are in? Which of them? Discerning our situation is the beginning of a deepening faith in Jesus Christ. Now we're going to have the reader come up and read the passage in just a minute. Um, and before he uh, reads it, though, I want to point out three things in the passage before he reads it. Because uh, three things really stood out to me in this, this uh, continuing ed course. But the first is that uh, the first three verses of Matthew chapter 6, they talk about an authentic relationship with the Lord. And so having this authentic relationship is vital. And so I ask you this question, how authentic is your relationship with the Lord? Verses 5 through 15 talk about prayer and how vital that is. And so, so having a, an authentic prayer life with the Lord is also vital. And so I ask the question, how authentic is your prayer life with the Lord? The last verse before he reads this morning talks about a singular priority. Anybody guess what that singular priority is? It's the Lord. Is the Lord on the top of your priority list? Now let's hear what uh, Gary has to read to us from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. The passage that he just read pointed three things out. Verses 22 and 23 talk about an attentiveness. How attentive are we to the Lord? And so where is your focus? Where is your focus when the trials of life, like the pandemic, like everything that's happening on beyond it, where is your focus when the trials of life engulf you. Listen, church, if we turn our focus inward on ourselves, which tends to be our tendency, we will continue to do business as usual. And if we do this, we will miss a tremendous missional opportunity. But if our eyes, if our attention, if our attentiveness is focused outward, which I believe it needs to be, we begin to see God's will in our lives. Why? Because, because we look at John's gospel where he says, God so loved where? The world. 
God loved the world. That's where he called us to serve because that's where he served himself. God did not remain in heaven to save us. God did what? He came down from heaven to earth to do what? To show the way. And so be attentive to the Lord and be attentive to his mission. So I ask, where is your focus? The second thing comes to us from verses 19 through 21 and that's pricelessness. Tell me, where is your treasure? Do you know what causes churches to die? The congregations see their church, their church, as the treasure. But if we turn ourselves, turn toward ourselves, and worry about how many people are coming to church, how our finances are playing out, uh, rather than uh, getting back to our relationship with the Lord, then that is where our treasures are, that's where our pricelessness is, and that is where we will remain. Yet if our treasure is in heaven, then our mission must be to connect society with the Lord in heaven not right here inside this church. And so that's the last one, that's pricelessness. We too, just like God, are called to come down from our heaven to show the way. Please recognize the value of the mission, the Lord's mission, and that is priceless. So where is your treasure? Here's the fourth, third one and the final one. It's, it's peacefulness. It comes to us from the, all of these verses that Gary just read. Where do you look to find peace? I don't know about you, but, but we have lived in the last year in a time where it seems like anxiety has ridden within the society, fear and anger and blame. It's all starting to become this uh, all-encompassing uh, constant barrage. It's ever-present within our lives. It's in our culture. It's in our uh, churches. And we anxiously ask, what is going to happen? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to society? How will we as a church start to move forward? How will we move forward if dot, dot, dot? How will we move forward if dot, dot, dot? Whatever that might be. Yet as we read this passage, as we engage deep in our faith inside this passage, what was Jesus saying in it? He said, why are you worrying? And then he provides us the answer. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all of these things, peace, attentiveness, relationship, provisions, whatever they may be, they will be added unto you. Everything that you worry about will be added to you. Isn't that an amazingly beautiful verse? And so where do you find peace? You see, we need to start with that discerning of what's happening in our society. Discerning our situation is the beginning of deepening of faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Eternal God, we ask that you allow us to discern the times in which we live. We ask that you allow us to feel your presence so that we can deepen our relationship in you. And it's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close in the final hymn, Our God.
God is healer. He's stronger. He's more powerful than any other God. And he will heal the church and he will heal us. So we go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.